Okay, welcome to this um, Grattan Institute webinar. Um, I'm sure people will gradually join as often happens the case with these things, but we'll, we'll get started so that we can um, ensure that you're all away on time. Uh, and that would be uh, by 1.15. Um, the, um, our objective uh, today really is to explore what I think is one of the interesting topics of the energy industry. But before we get into it, I wanna make do, do three things. Um, Firstly, uh, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the role of the State Library, the Victorian State Library. We are, uh, have a strong partnership with them. Um, in another time, in another place, we would have, in another time, certainly, we would have been doing this public seminar at the Victorian State Library. Um, we value their partnership, and um, I would like to think we'll get back to, certainly, not, if not every time, but certainly the majority of our public seminars will be done uh, in person at the State Library. Um, it's, a, it's a great venue and uh, those of you who have been there, I'm sure, would, uh, would agree with that. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is acknowledge um, the, um, the Larrakia people of the traditional owners of the Darwin region from where I'm speaking today, which is a good illustration of the way uh, we, we work in a, um, in, in a COVID uh, world. Um, but also the traditional owners of the lands where we are all located. And I, don't even, I wouldn't even attempt to speculate um, where that might be in Australia, but we do pay respect to their elders past and present, and acknowledge the role of the First Nations people in this country as having been the, you know, the oldest continuous cultures effectively in human history. Um, this afternoon, we're going to explore uh, an issue which is partly covered in a report that um, one of our speakers will, will discuss. The format will be uh, each of the speakers will um, present some of their thoughts in about 10 minutes each. We'll then have about 15 minutes of, of discussion amongst the panel and then open up to Q&A uh, from the audience. I've got some questions that have already been submitted and I may use those. Um, and obviously we'll encourage questions from the audience. In that, in that process, as we, as, the, as we manage these things from Grattan, uh, the way we'll do that, if you wanna submit a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, the way these sort of Zoom webinars work most effectively is if people follow that process, um, it does mean you don't get a chance to talk in person and berate somebody, but it does mean that um, uh, we don't have, uh, that we can manage the, the technology platform and it usually works pretty well. So I'd ask you to submit questions in the Q&A chat box. And obviously, uh, if you see a question that you uh, is in the same territory as your own, then by all means, vote for that question. That'll push it up the priority list and um, we'll certainly take that into consideration as we move forward. So, um, I think that's really evil for me. Now, the, the three speakers where we are very much privileged to have today, and you will have seen um, a little bit more about them in the, the blurb that went out with this, um, the invitation to this webinar this, today. Um, first, we've got Nicola Falcon, who's a very senior executive at the Australian Energy Market Operator, which is the entity, I guess, fundamentally responsible for making sure that we have a reliable and secure um, electricity network across, the, across Australia, but particularly across the national electricity market, which represents the um, effectively the East Coast states and excludes WA and the NT for physical reasons as much as anything else. Um, secondly, um, we, we also got Pierluigi Mancarello, who is from the uh, Melbourne University. Um, he is uh, very long experienced in um, uh, understanding and analysis of, the, of, of, of energy markets generally, not just in Australia. And I've, I've seen Pierluigi present on a whole range of issues and he's got some very a uh, very strong background to provide insights into what we're going to be talking about today. And then we've also got James Ha, who with me was a co-author of a report that we wrote recently from a Grattan perspective on um, what we called um, go, for zero, go for Net Zero. Um, and James will explain why the report is called that. But fundamentally, the issue we want to explore is um, what is the NEM going to look like in the future? What does the national electricity market look like? There are many people who would like to think we could close down all the coal-fired power stations by 2030 and electricity prices would come down because solar and wind are cheap and life would go on and we wouldn't notice anything. There are other people, um, uh, and some of you may be aware of, I won't, name them, I won't name them, but who I'm talking about, who would also argue, well, no, we do need base load coal-fired power stations and what we should be doing is making sure we keep coal-fired power stations in the mix for quite some time yet, on the, the basis being that they will be cheaper and they'll be more reliable than renewables. So they're quite different views. Um, and I think the interesting question really is, well, 
where's where are on our best information today? Where is the most likely uh, position to go? And what are some of the issues that arise when you start to think about moving from where we are now, uh, recognizing that each of the states have quite different combinations of uh, generation sources to a system where basically we end up with a system which is very much based upon near zero or zero emission technologies across the entire system. So um, it's not for me to get into that anymore. It's up to our three speakers. So I will now pass across to Nicola Falcon, who, as I said, is a senior executive at our EMO. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks, Tony, and, and afternoon, everybody. I'll just wait, B, I'm not sure if, uh, there we go, slides are coming up now. So look, just go to the first slide, uh, please, B. Um, first, I thought I'd quickly explain who we are and uh, what we do in case you're not all familiar with AMO. So we, we operate both the gas and the electricity markets in eastern and southern Australia, as well as the wholesale electricity market and power grid in southwest Western Australia. So our job is really to keep the lights on and the gas flowing. We're also the national transmission planner and one of my team's roles is to provide long-term demand and supply forecasts to support planning and decision-making. So essentially we need to plan the future NEM that our operators can operate reliably and securely. Let's just move to the next slide, B. So in our capacity as a national transmission planner, we're responsible for producing an integrated system plan. It identifies investment choices and recommends essential actions to optimise consumer benefits as Australia experiences what is acknowledged to be the world's fastest energy transition. That is, it aims to maximise cost or minimise cost and, and uh, risks of events that can adversely impact the future power costs and consumer prices, while also maintaining the reliability and security of the power system. The plan helps inform a number of bodies. So just the next uh, point B. It, it helps to inform a number of the bodies, including policymakers, investors, consumers, researchers, and other energy stakeholders. And it also performs a really important role um, as a regulatory function, identifying what we call actionable uh, ISP uh, projects, which are network and non-network projects that need to be investigated further by the transmission network service providers. So the most recent ISP was published in July last year, the, the 2020 ISP, and in that we looked at a step change scenario where both consumer-led and technology-led transitions occur in the midst of, of aggressive global decarbonisation. And we limited our analysis in that report to technologies that are currently both technically and commercially viable. So if we just go to the next slide. So this led to rapid decarbonisation of the NEM with accelerated retirement of coal-fired generation and strong growth in solar generation and wind. Now, if you look at the chart on the left, you can see um, that the black and the grey bars in that chart being uh, a relatively accelerated uh, closure of black and brown coal-fired generation. That is a, a much faster um, pathway of, of retirement than the expected closure years that they currently submit. Um, you can see also the green, orange and uh, yellow bars on that chart being the uh, new wind, large scale solar and behind the meter solar, so your rooftop PV and, and distributed PV, uh, filling up a large portion of, of the uh, capacity over time and making a, a majority of the capacity mix. And then we've got some of the um, uh, blue sort of coloured bars in this chart being the dispatchable storage um, and, and the hydro generation that really is needed to be able to provide uh, uh, the flex to the renewable generation and firm it over time. But the point I wanted to make was that even in that scenario, we did not reach zero NEM emissions by 2050. And this chart goes out to just past 2041, but the, the emissions beyond that to 2050, while we didn't publish it, they just sort of sat at about that level bouncing around for the step change scenario, which is the green line here. Um, it was assumed, and the reason we didn't go to zero emissions, but we uh, uh, stopped at uh, zero net emissions, was it was assumed that some emissions will still be required in the power system for system black start synchronous and peaking support capabilities. And that emissions reductions will become more cost effective in other sectors of the economy and that emissions produced in the NEM 
will be offset by negative emissions elsewhere in the economy. So that's how we sort of get to the, the net zero is by, you know, doing what we can in the electricity sector, but then um, assuming that at some point there's going to be a more uh, cost effective ways of uh, getting that last amount of emissions out of the system, either through negative emissions or other sectors decarbonisation. So is zero emissions achievable in the electricity sector by 2050? And you know that that is really the question of the, this webinar. And honestly, we are still finding out. Um, but on current technology projections, it would be very expensive. But we're learning fast, and and it's really important to to call this out. I feel because it allows us to focus on where research and development is going to be, um, you know, giving us the best bang for buck, so to speak, to try and actually work out how we can uh, progress that goal. It also helps us to build and share knowledge and know how, um, so that we can actually progress this. And there's a lot of work that we're doing um, with other uh, system operators internationally as well to try and make sure that we have a a very strong ground. Um, knowledge base to build on. So what is the problem you might ask? Um, you know, we're blessed in this country with a great solar resource and certainly if I look at the window today here in Melbourne, um, you know, the sun's shining, it looks wonderful. Uh, we've got plenty of land to accommodate a larger uh, carbon footprint um, for renewable energy. Um, and, and we have deep storages in Snowy, we've got deep storage in Tasmania that can help provide the daily, the weekly and the, the seasonal balancing. So we really are blessed with a lot of, of resources. I'll go on to the next slide, please, B. So in fact, in spring last year, South Australia's total energy needs were fueled by the sun for a few hours and gas and wind generation um, needed to be exported to Victoria. And this, well, you can see that in, in the chart here where um, if, if you look at the, the yellow and the, the darker yellow, all of the demand in, in South Australia was met by solar. We had some wind uh, being the green uh, and anything below the, the sort of red line of zero was surplus to what was required in South Australia and needed to be exported to Victoria. So we, we can meet 100% renewable generation in some areas, we already are. Uh, in some states. Now in this chart you can see that overnight, obviously when the sun isn't shining, um, we needed to still meet uh, sizable demand and that was being met by gas and by wind um, in this instance and, and you know there is no coal generation remaining in South Australia. So simply you could actually imagine well let's just keep building more and more solar um, with storage so that we can actually move anything excess from below the line here to, to start filling in these gaps in the overnight. And, you know, if we keep on building and building, building more renewable generation, more solar, more wind, surely that's going to actually get us to, to what we need to do from a, from a uh, zero emissions perspective. It all seems possible. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, across the entire NEM, we're also, so that, that was really looking at South Australia, but Across the entire NEM, we're also fast approaching 100% renewable penetration. Um, consumer demand could be entirely met by renewable generation, either behind the meter or on the grid. And just to help you understand these charts, what we're showing here is the, um, on the x-axis, it's the wind and solar in, in gigawatts across the NEM. If you just look at, say, that the first top uh, left uh, slide. And um, on the uh, y-axis, we're looking at what we call the synchronous generation. Um, which is uh, you know thing that's not the wind and solar. Now, if you had 10 gigawatts of wind and solar and 10 gigawatts of solar generation, we'd say that that's at about a 50% uh, penetration and that's where the dashed uh, line is on that chart. But you can see that over the last few years, we've been progressively um, moving towards and even exceeding that 50% and we're sort of well on the way in some states to getting up to 75% instantaneous penetration and in South Australia, as I just showed you, we've already been at 100. Now, in our renewable integration study that was published now a couple of years ago, um, we identified that targeted actions can actually overcome regional and NEM-wide challenges to allow the NEM to be operated at up to 75% instantaneous renewable penetration and possibly even more. Uh, provided that there's appropriate investment and system services needed to support this. But that's a difference talking about instantaneous penetration for a few periods in the year, um, you know, in, in spring, typically when demand is low and you've got a lot of solar uh, resources, 
But the question is, is it going to be economically and technically feasible to maintain this over the whole year? So if you think of the chart we showed before, where we had South Australia, we had a big, you know, duck curve in the middle of the day with the solar. But, you know, we were still needing to use thermal generation overnight to, to meet demand when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. Just go to the next slide, please, B. So AMO's role in all this is really to ensure the secure and reliable um, access of energy at all times. And in order to be able to do that, we need to make sure that electricity is available and can get to everyone safely when people need it. It's not just about energy, but we need other system services as well to be able to maintain that reliable, secure supply. The power system, if you like, is, is, is really just a huge complex machine. Um, it gets energy from hundreds of large generators, delivers it to millions of households and businesses of, of all sizes. Um, and many of those are also generating uh, their own power. So every millisecond, a supply and demand in that system needs to be balanced. And that's where the challenges can, can come in. In practice, that means managing a range of physical properties of the power system, such as balancing the demand and supply at that millisecond level, uh, managing uncertainty and variability, and certainly with more renewable generation coming to the system, um, uh, being able to predict uh, the weather and it becomes rather challenging at times, as well as the fact that it is uh, very variable. Uh, managing frequency is important, and we need to be able to monitor what we call system strength and voltage levels and, and, and a lot of other um, sort of engineering uh, focused things that are really important for maintaining reliability and security in particular. If those properties are not kept in check, then electricity may become unsafe to use. A large amount of people might actually be tempor temporarily um, losing power. But you also might notice strange things starting to happen to solar panels tripping off or lights flickering or fuse switches blowing and you know uh, disturbances to the, the equipment on the power system. When both supply and demand are subject to the vagaries of weather, this becomes even more challenging to manage. And it means that some of the traditional synchronous technologies that we do usually rely upon to manage the system security is no longer available to AMO. And these services need to be found elsewhere. And, and that's where really the, 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 some of the challenges from a technical point of view um, come to fall when we're looking at something like 100% renewables. So if I just jump to the, the next slide again, uh, so if I bring you back to the topic of this webinar, which is zero or net zero doesn't matter and why should we care? Well, to start with, we at AM and Care, because we need to have confidence that we're planning appropriately to ensure that future generations have access to reliable, secure and affordable power supply. The Grattan Institute in their report presented some options to eliminate emissions in the NEM and noted that the economics look challenging without making some fairly heroic assumptions around cost reductions in zero emissions firming technologies such as biomass, hydrogen fuel cells, nuclear or geothermal energy. Now they're um, zero emission dispatchable technologies, but a lot of them are still um, not yet commercialized. Some of you may remember some of the forecasts around the time the Ghana report was published uh, first back in 2008. Um, I was a, a young modeler there myself at the time. And, and you know, we, we were trying to anticipate the technologies that would, would come into the mix to um, deliver on a, a, um, a low carbon power system. And it certainly assumed certain technologies would become uh, commercialized in the near future. And they were things like hot, dry rocks, geothermal and carbon capture and storage. In the projections at that time, we were already seeing some generation um, and, and reasonable size generation forecasts from those technologies by 2020 um, and significant proportions by the time we got to 2050. Now, over a decade on, and these zero emission firming technologies are still not part of the generation mix. And we have to, had to learn to integrate variable renewable generation into the system the hard way. Now, this is not criticizing the forecasts of the time and, and back then. And, you know, as I said, I self declare I was, I was one of them, but it's, it's more the point that if we assume away what is going to happen in the future, we might actually miss some really important insights that we need to focus on to be able to make sure that we've got everything in place to be able to deal with the challenges. Now, if we assume technology will be part of the solution in the future, we might actually overlook some of the um, ways to overcome them, miss signaling opportunities for innovative solutions, 
and we also might um you know find that therefore we we lose out on ways that could deliver better outcomes cheaper outcomes for us in the future so instead our strategy at AMO is to really focus on partnering with industry research institutes market bodies to focus on four priority areas that help facilitate the energy transformation and those four are reliable and secure operations so that we can manage energy system reliably by adapting to changes in the generation including the fuel and the demand forecasting capabilities. Um, we're looking at future system design and Tony already sort of uh, has touched on the fact that there's you know a number of, of facets to uh, managing the transformation of the power sector. We need to be able to look at how to facilitate the future energy system to enhance reliability and security while lowering costs and incorporating emission policies. That, that's, you know, that's the, the problem statement. Uh, we need to look at adaptive markets and operations, and we need to be able to implement and shape new market arrangements together with stakeholders and in line with regulatory processes to support the energy transition to the benefit of all Australian consumers. And it is really about the consumer first. So we need to be able to empower consumers to exercise choice and control in the energy market through support of regulation, and easy access and sharing of data. Further in the 2022 integrated system plan, um, AMA will include a 2050 economy-wide net zero scenario that considers the impact of electrification of other sectors on the NEM. In this way, we aim to inform all of our key stakeholders, including policymakers, investors, consumers, researchers, other energy stakeholders, of what can currently be achieved and where more research is warranted. And that's why we should care about um, what is achievable now and what more we need to do. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Nicola. Um, I'm sure that's, that's a great introduction to what we, um, we want to cover today and we'll come back to some of your points, I'm sure, with the Q&A. Um, James, a good point for you to pick up in terms of the work that um, was done in the report that you and I gen jointly published only a couple of weeks ago. So over to you. Thanks, Tony. Um, so I'll just get up my slides, but uh, as Nicola's shown, the uh, ISP is a hugely important contribution to energy policy in Australia. Uh, and, and we drew heavily on, on some of the inputs that were published alongside of that for our own work. Um, Nicola talked about four key challenges, four key technical challenges for, for the grid um, across a variety of different timescales. Uh, the first one being hourly supply and demand balance, and that's that's really what, what we'll focus on here. So for us at Grattan, uh, our focus is always on uh, what governments should do to deliver what's best for Australians. Um, but we noticed that there's a really wide range of opinions on what the future of the NEM should look like across different policymakers and different political parties and different tiers of government. Uh, and even within the same political party, sometimes there are, there are often divergent views. So uh, as Tony alluded to in the introduction, uh, at one extreme is the claim that only coal can provide Australia with cheap, reliable power. And proponents of this view often tend to ignore the climate impacts of carbon emissions. Um, on the other extreme is the view that moving to 100% renewable electricity is not just feasible, but in fact, even cheaper than how we deliver power today. So uh, our project was really concerned with understanding the economic implications of different possible futures for the NEM uh, and understanding what trends might affect our conclusions. So we're certainly not trying to forecast the future, uh, but rather just understand under what conditions different policies would be appropriate for governments to take. Um, and some of you may have heard of a, of a classic trade-off in, in, in the electricity sector known as the trilemma, which is where we try to balance the emissions, the reliability and the cost of the electricity system. Um, and we wanted to understand and test uh, what it would take to ensure that a lower emission system would remain acceptably reliable um, and what the costs are of achieving that. Um, as I think it's widely understood at this point that, that wind and solar are very cheap sources of electricity, um, but they're intermittent sources, uh, which means that we need to invest in other solutions to make sure that electricity is available when consumers need it. Uh, and that's why just shoveling more renewables into the electricity system may not necessarily lead to the lowest cost outcome. Um, so because wind, because wind and solar are intermittent um, and because demand for electricity changes all the time, uh, we needed to build a model that could test whether different technology mixes would meet consumers' demand in a variety of different weather conditions. Um, and so, we, as mentioned, we use many of the same inputs that AEMO uses in their integrated system plan, 
uh, and that includes nine years of hourly solar wind and demand data from, from across the NEM. Um, but our model is much simpler than, than AEMOS uh, and only looks at the long-term outcomes uh, for the NEM rather than trying to determine exactly the best path to get there from where we are today. So we take as a given that we need an acceptably reliable electricity supply in future. And given that condition, uh, we investigate the cost implications of using different mixes to reach net zero emissions in the NEM, uh, given that all states and territory governments uh, are committed to net zero by 2050 at the latest. Um, so to put that another way, we're interested in what's the most economic way to decarbonize the grid um, and what are the, what are the key challenges that drive system cost? So we analyzed three scenarios in our report um, using 30%, 70% and 90% renewables. Um, so in our first scenario, uh, we maintained the coal fleet at its current capacity. Um, so as coal fired power stations, many of which, uh, all of which are aging, some of which are due to retire soon, as they are retired uh, in this particular scenario, we envisioned they were replaced with an equivalent capacity of, of new coal. Um, so that's why we call it the keep coal scenario. Um, our 70% renewable scenario had two thirds less coal capacity. Uh, while our 90% renewable scenario had no coal capacity at all. Um, and the, the key finding is really summarized on, on this slide. So, so I'll walk you through it. Um, we're plotting the cost of supplying net zero emissions electricity in each of those scenarios. So the orange bars are the cost of the infrastructure and fuels and everything needed to physically generate electricity. Um, the red bars are the costs of offsetting any emissions in the system to reach net zero. Um, and we've plotted this for four different possible offset prices. So $20 per tonne of carbon emissions, $50, $100, and $180. Uh, and based on future technology cost projections, it looks like the lowest cost way to supply net zero emissions electricity in the medium term, say in the 2040s, uh, is to use something like 90% renewable electricity, uh, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, um, firmed with batteries, more transmission, uh, and some gas. Uh, with the remaining emissions offset, most likely in the agricultural land sectors. Uh, but there are many, many caveats to this finding because the future is so uncertain. So for example, zero emissions uh, technologies could fall in cost faster, uh, which would mean aiming for a higher renewable share. Um, and, and this chart demonstrates the uncertainty around offset prices and how that would affect the renewable, um, the ideal renewable share. So uh, if offsets remain very cheap, you know, twenty dollars a ton, uh, which is very unlikely. Uh, but if if that were the case, then we could reach net zero uh, with fossil fuels still providing about a third of our electricity. Um, more likely, offsets will become very expensive, uh, which will mean cutting back on coal and gas use. So even at fifty dollars a ton, it makes more sense to target ninety percent renewables and seventy percent, um, so that there's fewer emissions left to offset. And the cost of offsets is likely to rise quite a lot as the whole economy approaches net zero, uh, because other sectors like industry and, and, and transport, particularly in you know, aviation, uh, will increasingly demand offsets themselves. So our conclusion from this analysis is that governments should be confident that we can achieve a very low emissions electricity system that's reliable uh, and relatively cost competitive with the system reliant on fossil fuels. Uh, but it's too early today to be committing ourselves to a 100% renewable future uh, when a slightly lower target and, and using some offsets might deliver the same climate benefit, but at a lower electricity cost for consumers. Um, of course, if the facts change, then we'll update our recommendations um, and we'll know a lot more about the economics of a net zero NEM in five or 10 years than we do today. Um, in, the, in the remaining time that I have, I did want to briefly discuss why we found a 90% renewable scenario to be lower cost than 100% renewables. And, and this sort of builds on some of the points that, that Nicola made. Um, so in this chart, uh, it looks very busy, but, but um, I'll, I'll explain what's going on. So we've plotted some of the data from our 90% renewable scenario. Um, and so each dot on this chart uh, is an hour, uh, an, uh, one of the hours in our modeling. Um, and it represents the difference between wind and solar supply uh, across the NEM minus total electricity demand. So any dot that's yellow and above the x-axis, that's an hour where there's more renewable energy available than is needed. Um, some of which might be stored, some of which might be spilled or wasted. Um, and the dots, the red dots below the x-axis, those are hours where there's less renewable energy than, than needed. 
Um, and so to meet demand, to meet all consumer demand, some electricity has to come from batteries or hydro or gas, for example. Um, as you can see, there's lots of times where there's way more renewable energy than needed and lots of times with much less. Um, and there's a huge amount of variability, um, both because of variability in demand and variability in weather patterns. So in, in the worst hour of our modeling, um, you know, 29 gigawatts of perpetual power was needed. Um, and you know, that, that worst point is very different from year to year. So in some years, sort of, you know, no more than um, about 20 gigawatts of perpetual power is needed. So quite a big difference. Um, and other times, yeah, wind and solar supply far outstrips demand. Um, this next chart is the same data, but averaged over fortnights instead of every single hour. Um, and so the key takeaway here is that there are some times, usually in winter, where a lot of firming capacity is needed for a long time. Uh, and this is because in winter, uh, average demand for electricity is higher and average solar output is lower. Um, if large parts of the NEM are then hit with several days of still conditions where wind output is below average too, uh, then you get a major energy deficit that is expensive to fill. So for instance, in the worst fortnight of uh, the nine years of our data, uh, over, uh, sorry, our 90% renewable system relied on an average of nine gigawatts of firming capacity for a straight fortnight. Um, so filling that sort of gap with storage, like batteries or pumped hydro, is very expensive. You'd need about nine Snowy 2.0 infrastructure projects uh, to, to fill a gap of, of nine gigawatts for, for a fortnight. So we found it much cheaper to fill it with a combination of gas and existing hydro in the NEM. Um, and then the, the batteries that we modeled also played a small role to the limited extent that they, that they could help over such a long duration. Um, an alternative but more expensive option is, is to build lots more wind and solar to make that deficit less bad and sort of shift the whole graph up. Um, but that also means more wasted energy at other times. And even in our 90% scenario, um, about 10% of the renewable energy generated is, is already wasted. So to reach 100% renewables, we could use renewable dispatchable fuels such as biomass or green hydrogen instead of fossil gas. Um, but even by 2040, it looks like renewable fuels will be more expensive than gas. So the lowest cost way to ensure reliability is to keep some gas capacity as a backstop for these uh, types of events. Um, and I guess because these periods of high demand, low wind and low solar output are pretty rare uh, and much worse in some years than in others, the NEM wouldn't actually use very much gas. So in our modeling, it didn't use any more than has been used historically. Um, and over time, as the cost of offsetting the emissions from the gas rise, or the costs of zero emissions alternatives fall, uh, the role for gas will likely fade away. Um, now, there are many parts of the transition that, that we didn't consider in detail, including the system security issues that Nicola raised. Um, but if, if we count on AEMO to resolve those over the next few years, uh, then we think it's appropriate for governments to commit to net zero emissions in the NEM by the 2040s, in anticipation of reaching a net zero, uh, of reaching net zero economy wide by uh, 2050. Um, and whether that timeline is brought forward uh, will depend on the difficulty in decarbonizing other sectors of the economy, as well as Australia's overall climate objectives. Um, and this was sort of beyond the scope of, of our report, but remain active areas of interest for us here at Grattan. So thanks. Excellent, thank you, James. Um, now I'll find for our third speaker, past to Pia Luigi. I'm um, just remind people that if you do want to ask a question, uh, please use the Q and A uh, uh, link at the bottom of your screen. And um, also, if there's questions already raised, if you click on that um, and you want to basically support one of those questions, then by all means, please do so. Pia Luigi. Thanks, Tony, and uh, uh, yeah, thanks again for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. I would like to to bring a little bit of a perspective. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's it's like technical perspective that uh, um, aligns somehow with what uh, has been mentioned earlier. So uh, focus on these aspects of reliability, but also resilience uh, that James uh, uh, just just mentioned uh, for uh, long periods without wind uh, and, uh, um, and and sun, for example. So uh, to to put this in context, uh, it's like if we look at the system as it is today, like who is providing reliability and flexibility. And reliability. Then you look at uh, what's happening in the market. Uh, effectively, what you have uh, is uh, have a mix uh, of uh, units, uh, flexible or inflexible units, uh, that are the ones that can supply some uh, reliability in different ways. 
or you know if you look at interconnectors be, between states in fact you can transfer reliability and other services across uh, across states now if you look at uh, uh, if you focus on what's happening to conventional generators uh, of course uh, then we know that with the more and more um, renewables in the system uh, some of them have been displaced and of course you will, you will start displacing uh, for different reasons, uh, um, including our political discussions, the ones uh, that are um, polluting most, uh, so uh, coal in particular. And then if you are in other countries, there are lots of debates about uh, um, nuclear, again, for, for, for similar reasons. Now, what's happening tomorrow then? No, well, probably uh, we're moving towards the uh, future, uh, as, as again was, was like discussed just earlier, where also other uh, commercial generators might be uh, disappearing from the system for different reasons, particularly gas. Uh, in um, uh, and and then uh, what's what, what 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 do we do? You know, it's like if most of the uh, providers of reliability uh, effectively go uh, out of the market, then what happens to the system? And we've seen already this uh, in terms of security and um, with you know. The, 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 the grid overall is becoming more fragile uh, uh, while we lose uh, uh, synchronous generators. And then we are learning actually um, and really pioneering uh, with what, what's happening in Australia and work that that they is doing, how to manage the system for security uh, with lower and lower levels of commercial generators. Now, how do we deal then with um, re reliability and the need to meet uh, the, the, the big demand uh, uh, in, in particular, while, while we evolve to a future system that will be potentially very uh, different. Of course, uh, uh, the, the main ideas are we rely on uh, uh, storage and pump hydro, uh, and we have plenty of pump hydro uh, options, fortunately. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, you know, and and then we we need to see what role uh, it, it can play in the future. Now. How much do we need? And uh, is this uh, uh, the best uh, option also from an economic perspective? Uh, if you look at this from a technical perspective, I'm warning you, this is uh, it's, 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 it's a complex slide, but please bear with me. If you look at this from a technical uh, perspective, what you will see in the slide is effectively, what you measure here is the loss of low probability. So it's, it's just a measure of the level of reliability in the system. And then you would see for different penetration level of wind and solar in the system, and it added up to 100 gigawatt of renewables for different penetration levels of pump tidal storage and for different penetration level availability of conventional generators. What are the reliability performance of the system if you also consider that pump tidal will have uh, a different level of energy availability in terms of duration of pump tidal. So effectively what we did here, we parameterized uh, uh, studies against level of pump tidal in terms of capacity plus duration. So we have actually uh, like the, the, the two dimensions, but eventually what really matters here is uh, the, the, the energy level of, of pump tidal because that's really the, the, the problem we will see with reliability as it was already shown by, 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 by James. So what you notice from this analysis is that if you really look at the system without conventional generators, even with 30 gigawatt pump tidal and 24 hours durations, which is basically, you know, it's like very, very big, uh, uh, more than we were going to uh, plan possibly, you still have a very substantial level of loss of low probability. And then the moment that you have a 15 gigawatt of conventional generation, you see that basically the, 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 um, the, the loss of low probability goes to zero. So effectively you, you are able to have a system or, or close to zero. You're able to have a system that is very, very reliable, the same level pretty much that we have today. And not surprisingly, if you look at uh, what Nicola was presenting earlier, we see that in 2040, there is about 15 gigawatts of conventional generators there in the system. That, that you know are there also to provide this kind of reliability level, and then of course uh, if you have uh, even if you have actually less pump tidal with this kind of level of commercial generation, you see that you're still able to meet uh, uh, to, to have very good reliability performance, and then of course uh, 
uh, you know, if you if you have even more uh, conventional generation, then basically you are you are very flexible uh, in terms of reliability. It's not really it's not really a problem. Uh, so this is really somehow describing the challenge of say, can we displace uh, all conventional generators? And besides all the issues with security that have been discussed, past also meet these uh, uh, reliability challenges. Uh, to give you a different perspective and see whether we can find a way to do with our commission generators or not. There's also a perspective of uh, the direction of flexibility and reliability provision, which again, at the moment, it's all coming from uh, large conventional generators uh, and then provide, of course, uh, uh, electricity in different way, energy and uh, various system services as Nicola was, uh, um, was, was, was mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, basically this direction from, from large scale generators to uh, the uh, re re relatively inflexible demand. And in the future, of course, we more and more wind and solar, including at the level transmission, uh, transmission system, uh, be much more uh, inflexible overall with some support, uh, the pump tidal, uh, because you know, we can manage flexibility, we can provide different levels of reliability. Are we forgetting something of this? Uh, well, effectively, the system is, is is changing greatly and uh, rapidly, as we know, uh, at the level of the distribution networks. And as we already know, the, there are plenty of new technologies that are coming up in the distribution network and plenty of new concepts, uh, uh, both from technical perspective and a commercial perspective that have been developed that could be effectively a game changer also in terms of providing system reliability. So when we talk about microgrids, for example, and uh, the role of distribution system operators to enable of these new technologies uh, and new architectures. So we talk about distributed energy systems, digital energy systems, communities, virtual power plants, of course, microgrids. All, all these effectively, they have a role that would be very, very important to uh, explore also in terms of providing uh, reliability because effectively they're suddenly you, you, you start interfacing all these technologies with the rest of the system. And uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, what could happen actually is very, very different from what we uh, see, uh, see today. Because effectively, once you start having a much more electrified uh, uh, transport fleet, much more electrified uh, um, uh, heating system I mean, in, 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 in those few states where we need heating, couple to distributed batteries and all uh, the uh, concepts that we develop around that, then uh, you might be able to uh, find uh, much, much more resources to provide uh, uh, reliability addition to uh, other, other services like various uh, security services. Now, the challenge uh, though remains uh, when we talk about black swans, so it's really like the very extreme events with low wind, low solar that are very rare, and and in many cases may be very well unexpected, but very very rare. You know, this is really the key point. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, we don't want obviously no one wants to become like Texas and experience uh, uh, situations like this. So is there a risk, uh, you know, with uh, like a renewables based system that this might um, this might happen. Well, uh, in, in reality, uh, it, is, uh, it is very difficult, as James was, was, was mentioned earlier, and expensive but to have a system that achieves a very high level also resilience. So in this picture here, what we're showing is for different portfolios of the um, uh, conventional duration mixes plus mixes of batteries and pumped hydro. In here, you show basically an indicator that uh, is associated with reliability, expect change of supply. And here it is uh, a, a, an indicator that is associated with resilience, very extreme events. Well, effectively, and this is the cost uh, that you, the investment cost for the storage technology in these portfolios. You, you see that the system is still very, very expensive, uh, even if you have very large uh, issues uh, with the, uh, um, with, with, with resilience. There are ways somehow to bring this down through sort of intelligent control and change a little bit the mix of technologies, but it's still very expensive and, and, very, and very difficult, as again, also uh, mentioned by James. So we will need to think also of other options to really become uh, resilient uh, 
to uh, very extreme uh, um, scenarios. And uh, one of the options that uh, uh, should be considered probably more, and I mean, there is lots of research that has been done in this direction, uh, is obviously the uh, if the system changes uh, more or less radically because also more and more future fuels come into, come into the game, uh, and then some, somehow you create new forms of storage uh, for, for the system through future fuels such as hydrogen and, and others. But also given the fact that we might uh, in the future uh, develop an, um, an export industry of these future fuels, then this again would create uh, very large buffers uh, that uh, potentially we might uh, like switch off completely for a few days at least, uh, it was needed to, to provide electricity in case uh, to, to, to other sector in terms to Australia rather than, uh, for example, uh, transform electricity into hydrogen and export it outside. So there, is, there, is a, there, are, there are futures that probably would be worth at least uh, uh, exploring. I mean, there are, there are several of us doing the work in this direction, of course. Uh, and um, you know it's it's it, it is difficult, but I think the work that we're doing all together is very is very good going going forward. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Pierluigi. Um, I think that rounds things off, and it's already um, managed to create quite a lot of interest and questions. Um, so I guess uh, there's quite a bit of, of of interest, I think, given the questions that were submitted before the seminar today, and those have been submitted as we go. Um, just want to get into a couple of them and then we'll come back to some which um, many of you can see your screens already. Um, this whole question of, um, of, of offsets. So, you know, we know the prime minister talks about net zero. We know many companies are talking about net zero. Joe's made the point that uh, all the states and territories in Australia have already committed to net zero. The question arises: well, what do we mean by net zero? And what is the role of, of offsets in that world? And I don't know whether all three of you, but certainly I know James, you might want to comment on on, on how that. What what is this all about? This net zero thing. And I know, and and you know, Nicola referred to it as well. Sure. So net zero as a concept means that uh, a company or a country or or in our report the NEM. Uh, this entity might produce some emissions, but for every ton of emissions it produces. Uh, one ton of emissions is removed from the atmosphere. So on balance, there's no net increase in greenhouse gases. Um, now that's different to zero emissions, which is where a entity does not emit at all. Um, there are two main types of offsets uh, that, that, can be, that can be bought and sold in the world at the moment. Um, one of them is called a removal offset. So that is where literally one ton of emissions in the atmosphere is, is drawn down, potentially through planting of trees or sequestering it in soil carbon. Um, the other way is, is what is called an avoidance offset. And that is where uh, effectively I would pay someone else to reduce their emissions. So maybe um, uh, I pay someone to switch to energy efficient light globes or to switch from, um, you know, building a coal-fired power station to a, to a solar farm. Um, these two types of offsets uh, will have very different roles as we approach net zero. So the avoidance offsets, where you, you pay someone else not to do something, not to produce emissions, uh, they will cease to exist in a net zero economy. If I guess if you imagine a world where we're at net zero, that means uh, you know, every, every um, source of emissions is exactly um, uh, offset with a with with a ton of emissions removal from the atmosphere. In that situation, uh, there's no one to pay to to um, uh, I guess pull down emission uh, to 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 reduce their own emissions um, in order to offset your activities. These these sorts of things um, uh, are not valid ways of getting to to net zero. At at that point where the entire economy is at net zero, the only option. If you want to produce emissions, it has to. You have to um, exactly offset that with a ton of emissions removal from the atmosphere. That's that's the only option, um, and that's one of the reasons why we think the cost of offsets is likely to rise a lot as you approach net zero because you have two, two factors, I guess. So a reduction in, in the supply of offsets because the avoidance ones cease to exist, and uh, potentially also a reduction in supply because there are limits to, I guess, how many trees you can plant and to how much um, carbon you can sequester in soils. 
Um, and then you also have rising demand as other sectors or uh, known as the hard to abate sectors where, where it's very expensive to deploy zero emissions or, or potentially infeasible to deploy zero emissions alternatives. Um, and these sectors include things like steel, cement, uh, aviation. Uh, those sectors are likely to increasingly demand um, what offsets there are, what scarce offsets there are in order to, in order to reach net zero. Um, so that combination of reducing supply and increasing demand is likely to push the price up. Okay, thanks, James. I think the um, look, we'll we'll come to some of the other issues rather than expand everyone's view on the same issue. We might be able to cover some more territory if we start to move into some of the questions. And um, if anyone's got any extra bits they want to add in, please please do so. Um, Nicola, one of the the, the, the question that that's come up, which has um, had most of the support so far, um, and we know James referred to this a little bit when he talked about um, demand, is um, well, we've we've. You can assume that things are where they are now, but of course, there are a couple of big things that could change demand significantly. One would be um, uh, if some of the large gas users were to close down, for example, that or electricity users because they found electricity too expensive for some reason or they can't reduce their emissions. Um, aluminium smelters would be a, one obvious example. A second one would be if, um, if we do decide that we can't burn gas anymore and we need to move all of that gas load to electricity, that would have some implications. And the third one, which is the subject of the question that uh, uh, on our list is um, uh, electric vehicles. A lot of speculation recently about what sort of policies the Australian government should have. But, um, you know, what's your, what's your view and how is AMO thinking about um, the integration of electric vehicles uh, into the grid and what impact is that likely to have, positive or negative? Um, and we know what's happened with solar rooftop, uh, rooftop solar. Um, are we likely to face the same problems or can we get on top of it quickly before we do see, uh, we become all like the word will be drowned in electric vehicles? Yeah, they're great questions. And, and, you know, we've for a while now included electric vehicle forecasts in our forecasts of demand and consumption. And, uh, you know, we look at it under a number of different scenarios. So even in the step change scenario that I showed in that chart in my presentation, it had a, a relatively large degree of electrification of the transport fleet in that so that we really do understand what the impacts might um, be on the uh, power system. I think a, a couple of things to, to note about it is, is that the energy consumption from electrification of a large portion of the fleet is actually relatively small proportion of total energy demanded in Australia. So we're not talking about a doubling or a tripling of energy demand from electric vehicle uh, alone. And certainly if we start looking at electrification of a number of the other sectors, including gas and everything you were talking about as well, then you know we could see quite significant changes. But there's a difference also between um, energy demanded on a sort of an annual basis and time of when the energy is demanded. And so one of the things that we're very mindful of, of and uh, you know we've actually had a number of, of workshops and, and dealings with uh, the electric vehicle councils and, and industry as well, is to, to better understand what time of use of charging and discharging of electric vehicles might be how consumers are going to want to be able to you know use their cars is it going to be that they just have the convenience of getting home charging it at night and it just happens to be at the same time as everyone's turning on their their heating and their air conditioning and, and everything else or is there going to be some more smarts around it in terms of being able to control that that uh, charging until later in the day or, or maybe when we're all coming into work and charging in the middle of the day rather rather than the evening so so the time of when uh, it's going to be charging is going to actually have quite a significant um, impact on whether we're going to need a lot more infrastructure in the electricity system to better support that or not now we're mindful that people aren't going to make decisions on how they use their vehicles just because of uh, what's going to suit the power system and when we want the demand on the system that that's not the reality people need to be able to use their vehicles to to get about that's that's you know the, the main objective but it's really more about understanding what therefore we might be able to do um, with the integration to your point around uh, pvs we don't want to be caught uh, unawares of, of a where the charging stations are occurring, you know, how many vehicle sales are there going on, how we can actually better inform some of the discussions about uh, tariff incentives and other things that might actually help to um, get a more coordinated integration moving. That, that's really where we want to be focusing. Look, I think you're right. And I think that as we saw with the rooftop solar, um, what we do want to do is start to understand what the challenges might be ahead of time and then provide as much information as we can to people who are taking their decisions. Um, you know, I know people who would probably drive 
10 kilometers to save one cent a liter on their petrol. Um, probably cost them more in petrol than they, than the, in, their, in their travels than it would have been what they've saved. But equally, you know, the same things, there'll be differences. Who knows how people are gonna use their electric vehicles yet, but it's gonna be a, a really important question to get on top, on top of, um, because it's gonna, there's no doubt it's gonna have, have some serious implications. Um, another issue that um, I know even in the questions that were submitted um, before, before, this, before this afternoon, um, and it comes up in the questions today, <clears throat> Uh, somewhat indirectly, is the, is the role of hydrogen. It would be very unusual to have a discussion about the energy sector, certainly the future energy sector, without discussing hydrogen at some point. Um, the particular question uh, that's come up is, um, do we see hydrogen being used for power generation? Um, I'm not sure the implication would be as, as a fuel for a combined cycle gas turbine, or whether in some other form. But Pierre, Pierre Luigi, would you like to just say, uh, share your view on about how you see the role of hydrogen um, as it's likely to emerge as part of the the changing um, changing system, yeah. No, th thanks, Tony. Yeah, uh, there is uh, uh, obviously there, there are the multiple paths there. Uh, the 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 use of hydrogen as a fuel for for combined cycles and all that uh, obviously would be associated with the idea of having some storage, which actually would be very relevant. Sort of discussion we're having. However, this will probably be as part of a broader portfolio of utilization of hydrogen, for example, to decarbonize. Uh, uh, other, other, other industries. So, and again, with this idea of creating maybe a business for uh, hydrogen, hydrogen export. Uh, so uh, to really go with uh, sort of hydrogen scale uh, is, is really important. We, create, we can create uh, some form of um, economy of scope where actually you can address uh, like multiple sectors. And then once mm -hmm. you do that, probably you could also find a role for hydrogen inside uh, the uh, electricity sector uh, through uh, you know, providing like storage, like like deep storage that would be needed to, particularly to for for resilience purposes. Um, it's one of those futures I think would be worth exploring. Again, many people are working in uh, in this direction. And uh, uh, I mean, as I see hydrogen, I saw that there was another comment. I, I see particularly hydrogen as green hydrogen, given you know that the focus is really about decarbonizing everything and. Uh, has been discussed, there are lots of opportunities in terms of renewables. So I think it's about understanding how com complementary um, like renewables and uh, a green hydrogen sector uh, would would be. And I mean, our, our modeling so far already shows that uh, the, the, this, this two somehow can be co-developed. Probably they should be co-developed uh, from both a technical and a commercial slash market perspectives. And once you, you do this for proper uh, proper regulatory mechanisms, actually, you can find a win-win solution, but yeah, there's lots of work before getting there. <laughs> James, you did some work on this, I think, in the, in the <clears throat> report we've been talking about, or you were talking about. Um, to what extent do you think yeah, hydrogen will solve it? I mean, all we have to do is get the, you know, get enough hydrogen and it'll solve the winter problem. How, how, do, how do you think about that question as, 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 one, as the solution, as hydrogen solution to the, to the um, winter shortage problem? Sure. So I guess the there are two ways that it can help. One is as a dispatchable fuel source. So we store the hydrogen and then run it through gas turbines or run it through fuel cells to produce electricity when needed. Um, the other way it can help is as a flexible demand source. So a lot of people um, talk about the idea that because uh, renewable generation is so variable and there will be periods where we have too much renewable supply, um, what if we just had really large flexible demand sources um, and, and if you're producing green hydrogen, then you're, you're running electricity through a machine called an electrolyzer, which produces the hydrogen, and, and that can be turned up and down really quickly. Um, and that's a, it's certainly potentially the case that if we have a large green hydrogen manufacturing industry in Australia, that could be a large source of flexible demand for the NEM and could uh, help to reduce the overall system cost um, of, of, of moving to increasingly high renewable penetrations in the NEM. Uh, there are some uncertainties though, and there are limits, I guess, to the flexibility of using hydrogen and, and the flexibility of, of hydrogen as a, as a source of demand. So, and, and those flexible, the, the extent to which can be used flexibly is it's very hard to predict now, but potentially if we're producing hydrogen for other industrial uses in Australia, such as making green steel or making green ammonia, those industrial processes are gonna need a flat load of green hydrogen. So you might be able to turn down the hydrogen uh, electrolyzers for a few hours or a few days, but 
ultimately that will depend on how much hydrogen storage we have and where we're storing that hydrogen and how good our, hy our hydrogen transportation system is. Um, and that, 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 will, that will determine, I guess, how long you can switch the electrolyzers off and divert that power into the NEM. I guess the other thing is if we're exporting hydrogen directly to overseas markets, um, it will depend on, on the, the contracts that we have with, with our import with importers of our hydrogen um, as, to, as to how flexible we can be. If you're using you know, large amounts of solar to produce hydrogen, then you have sort of a similar problem that the NEM will face where solar output is lower in winter, which means your hydrogen production could be lower in winter. Um, and given that we've seen, um, you know, the, the real challenge for a high renewable NIM is likely to be in winter, uh, th that potentially is, uh, uh, I guess, would, would make me think twice about hydrogen being a silver bullet solution for us to get to 100% renewables, say, in the NIM. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the other, I guess, inherently behind some of this is, um, is the sort of, to what extent various things can contribute. And, you know, we've couple of times talked a little bit about transmission um, you know why not just you know it's always going to be blowing somewhere so why don't we just connect the whole system up and make sure we can move the wind from where it is to where where it needs to be or um, I was going to say it's always the sun's always shining somewhere but that's not in Australia obviously <laughs> um, so when we think about the role of, of, of the transmission system um, I guess there's, there's two and maybe there's even we need to just understand a little bit about the two parts of that transition transition system transmission system one is the the sort of what we call the interregional or interstate uh, big transmission lines that move power between them and the other one is we're as we're changing to a system with lots of um, uh, more remote renewable energy this concept of renewable energy zones and how that plays a role Nicola can you talk a little bit about um, how the transmission system developments are likely to contribute to our capacity to meet the uh, to, to to move towards a, a very high level renewables in the in the, in the NEM. Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, the system has been built on uh, a completely different location of, of generation source, and that is, you know, your, your coal and here in Victoria, the Latrobe Valley, and and so forth. And the transmission system is built about around that. But obviously, a lot of the new renewable energy sources. Um, are in very different areas within the states and they need transmission to connect them to the loads. Um, the question's really going to be, is that going to be almost a, a system of different federations of each state having their own level of transmission to connect the generation to get into the, to the load centres? Or is there going to be value in actually having those interconnectors to, you, to your point, Tony, to actually be able to share renewable generation across states? Um, if, if you've got a very, very large dominated solar system, one might actually argue that diversity is not going to be a huge value add for interconnectors because, you know, apart from half an hour difference, the sun rises and falls pretty much at the same time within the eastern states of Australia. So um, on the contrary, if you've got a lot of wind, um, there is actually quite good negative correlations between wind, for example, in Queensland and wind when it generates at what times in other parts of the NEM. So in those sorts of situations, you can actually see great value in having interconnectors so that you can actually build less renewable generation overall and be able to make better use of the generation that you do have uh, as, as efficiently as possible by maximising that value of diversity. Um, there are a number of things when you then think about it, interconnectors, about thinking of their route selection so that you can actually go via a number of renewable energy zones and pick up a lot of generation along the way. Um, but then that uh, sort of creates questions of what type of transmission would you want to build in the system as well? And so it should be DC, should it be AC? What are the costs if you want to actually connect people, uh, generators up along the way? Then there's a lot of, um, you know, different uh, cost factors that you need to think about as well. So it will depend a little bit on the mix of renewable generation. Um, what we aren't also talking about is the distribution level network and investment that's going to be required so particularly if you do have a lot of uh, generation on people's homes and it's going to become two-way and be able to be exported to the grid uh, what investment might be needed at the distribution level to be able to accommodate that or do we just m minimize the amount of transmission build use more storage and try and get the generation out that way so there's a number of, of different pathways that we still need to sort of keep an eye on and i guess one of the challenges with this is um there are a lot of things which are almost obvious today, some that are uh, reasonably clear but expensive and some we just don't know about. And some of those harder ones at the end there are uh, the risk of wanting to get things in place early enough 
to make sure we don't have a problem. But then the risk of discovering that, oh my God, that was something we shouldn't have done. We end up with you know, stranded assets, uh, particularly in this area can be quite significant. And at some point one suspects that you end up making your, make your best choices and hopefully we get most of it right. I think getting it all right might be a bit of a challenge if, uh, if even, the, even the best minds at AMO. Um, so um, a little bit, I think there's gonna be some really big challenges there. Um, so you've got to sort of, you know, trying to solve this issue or what combination of technologies, and we've obviously focused um, pretty much on the generation side being uh, wind and solar. Um, and you know, Australia is uh, arguably one of the few countries in the world that's got a lot of wind and solar relative to our population. But a couple of other, and I, I, I have not seen anybody mention, and I don't want to even go anywhere near the concept of geothermal again. You mentioned it before, uh, Nicola, a hot rock geothermal. Um, that was that was going to be the great hope many many years ago, and so technically it turned out to be uh, not so much. Although I hear it's becoming, it's getting a resurgence of interest in the United States at the moment. So we'll see. The other area is that you know, for a country like Australia, have come up uh, are things like offshore wind um, and uh, wave technology. Pierluigi, if you have you looked at, you know, I know you've looked at wind quite a bit. If you looked at the potential role of offshore wind, and maybe that can broaden into another question that's come up as well. What are other countries doing? Because I'm sure many of the people on this webinar have heard that in places like the UK, for example, they're looking at offshore wind as being the big answer. So how do you, how do you, what do you think about the, that as that or the or wave technology being a significant part of, of, of the sort of um, energy mix in the future? Yeah, so I think, I think uh, that, that's a great question, Tony. I think uh, that each country should really look at uh, how unique they are. Because also the UK has got a huge investment in... Uh, solar and uh, having been living in the uk for 10 years i'm not very sure that that's a great idea <laughs> so we really need to be looking at uh, you will have a certain budget where are you spending your your budget right and uh, obviously in the uk you know north sea and all the area there is that huge wind resources they are particularly great you know uh, like offshore and because of high capacity factors and all that actually it may make sense uh, uh, although there are, of course, also like huge technical issues when you really need to, 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 to deal with that. In Australia, where we are blessed literally with onshore resources, both wind and solar, uh, I would think that uh, the question is not so much why do I, I, aren't we doing like off, offshore? Because it's like there is so much already uh, that is, that, that is uh, available. It's really about how do you come up with the optional portfolio itself. Now, whether it is onshore, offshore, there are, there are different factors there, but I don't think that uh, considering offshore, considering, um, you know, like wave and other technology would make a big, a big difference. Yeah. It, um, someone may very well pull the new technology out of their back pocket in the next 30 years, but I suspect we've got a plan to utilize the ones we know about already at the moment and, and, and get on with that. Uh, we're, we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, and so, well, there are a lot of questions and we may try and see if we can directly answer some of those questions separately and offline to this, to this conversation. Um, but I wanted to leave it to each of the panelists to um, sort of sum up as to, well, you know, we, we've talked quite a lot about the, about the future because I think if you haven't got at least a view of what that future needs to be, whether you talk about net zero by 2050, or whether you talk about zero, or you talk about 100% renewables by whatever date, um, and that was that's been the deliberate intent of this of this webinar today. But I guess in in finishing, I'd be interested to if I ask each of you. Well, having thought about that, what does that tell us about what we should be thinking about now? Does it mean that there are things we should be not worrying about for a while yet, but we should be focused on, on X, but rather we should be focusing on A? Or how does, how does this thinking about what the future NEM looks like is influencing our thinking today? Um, Pierre Luigi, would you, let's go in reverse order from where we started. Pierre Luigi, would you like to start with that one, please? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, it's, it, it is essential actually to, to do this like uh, th thinking now and if actually much of the work uh, research work that we're doing is really trying to develop tools that somehow can facilitate an understanding of how you can flexibly evolve uh, uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, and uh, um, so this issue of, of flexibility in planning particularly is something that you need to plan now basically to understand how to do it better. And if you 
if, if you're not able to do it properly um, with, with the right tools and the right methodologies and all that, actually they are, they, 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 it, may, it may be very, very expensive given the, the huge uncertainty they are in, uh, in, in front of us. So yeah, absolutely, it's, it's something that we should be thinking of now. All right, thank you. James? Sure, so from our work, we, we were thinking about what, what advice we give governments today, what should they be thinking about? And I guess one conclusion from, given, given that a higher renewables system can be affordable and is a, a really powerful way to bring down, to, to slash emissions in, in the electricity sector, uh, that would suggest to us that one thing governments shouldn't be doing is uh, intervening in the market, for example, by trying to keep existing coal-fired power stations open beyond their nominated closure dates. Um, a second uh, issue is that I guess we're seeing states increasingly um, talk about going it alone in the energy transition. Um, and the work that we did, uh, so we, we modeled um, scenarios without more connection, more transmission between states, greater interconnected capacity. And we found that to get to really high renewable penetrations, it is better for consumers if there is more transmission linking the states so that they can take advantage of the diversity of renewable resources we have in Australia. So that's just to us that states should really be recommitting to the NEM rather than trying to go it alone if they want to deliver the lowest cost outcome for, uh, for their residents. Um, and uh, I guess a second issue that then needs to be solved that, that states are kind of arguing about today is who pays for these upgrades. So that is a issue that is definitely uh, needs to be solved in, in the near term so that we can uh, ensure that these infrastructure projects are delivered on time or ahead of time rather than, you know, after we've had a really significant coal closure, say. All right. Thanks, Jane. And um, Nicola, you, you, in your presentation, you talked a bit about the role of um, AEMO in the planning for this, uh, for these various futures. Um, it, to what extent is this, you know, what are the things you, you're now really putting at the top of your list, the things that uh, sure keep you awake at night, but the, the things that get the priority now, um, recognising there are so many things that are yet, as you said before, in relation to transmission, for example, so many uncertainties, but that you still have to get on and do your job, right? So what are the things you, you then say, okay, these are the things we can get on with confidence and maybe we need to, you know, maybe need to have a few options in place, but uh, how are you thinking, you know, to what extent is this sort of looking towards the future then influencing how you deal with today, recognizing most of your organizations as much concerned about keeping the lights on today as it is about what might happen in the future? Yeah, look, I mean, one of the things that we're acutely aware of is that things are happening a lot faster than we've been anticipating. So, you know, we've, we have been talking today about 2050. Um, I showed that slide of tip, step change, which was only two years ago, seemed to be a very extreme scenario. We're getting more PV and more renewable generation built today than even in those scenarios. So, you know, things are happening quickly. We've got consumers now that are focusing on decarbonisation. So we've always been thinking of from a sort of a macro level and the system down as to how do we decarbonise the power system. It's actually turning it around. What's the consumer centric focus? What are they wanting? What are their preferences? How are they wanting to use energy supply in the future? Um, and how can we actually best facilitate and support that? So a lot of the things that we're really focusing on is, is trying to get out of the way as much as we can and, and be able to enable consumers to use their power, how they would like to. Um, we're looking at uh, virtual power plants and, and some of the, the pilot projects there to see if, if that can actually help um, to, to Pierre Louise's point about, you know, some of the stuff at the distribution network and behind the meter that can actually help provide some of that flexibility. But we're also um, really just trying to accelerate our understanding from an engineering perspective of, of what needs to be done because things are happening that quickly and will continue to happen that quickly. So we're, we're um, working with the industry on an engineering framework in particular to make sure that we've got the right priorities that we can focus on in the right time. Um, we can't be left uh, asleep at the wheel. <laughs> no, indeed, that would be very bad. <laughs> um, look, I think it's, it's, it's come to a close. Um, there's a number of issues in the electricity sector that we deliberately have not touched upon today, and some of them are playing out um, almost as we speak. Um, I'm sure many of you on this call today would, would be aware that governments are talking about um, direct load control intervening and in turning off your air conditioner, uh, for example, seems to be one of the, uh, the big threats. Uh, the idea that um, we might um, be, when people have been feeding electricity back into the grid from their solar system, 
at certain times of the day, the sort of chart that Nicola put up earlier suggests that maybe we'd even to try and control that and um, might even charge people putting electricity in the, into their, into the, back into the grid. There's a whole range of issues that emerge from that. Um, the whole issue of the future of the gas uh, network, we, we touched upon that earlier as to well, what really would build, will be the role of gas, um, particularly in places like Victoria, which use a lot of gas for heating, moving that to electricity could be quite a challenge. And then there's, of course, everything outside electricity that's going to be relevant to the important issue of climate change, because whilst electricity today is about a third of our total emissions, um, that's likely to, and that's likely to increase. Um, on the one hand, it's likely to increase as we, we electrify, but at the same time, hopefully, we're also reducing the emissions intensity of electricity in the way we've been describing. And I think that uh, a lot of it will mean the, prop, the issues that we've been talking about today, particularly in terms of me, uh, having very high levels of renewables. Um, as we add more and more demand, that just probably, in most cases, will uh, not make much difference to the nature of the problem. It, will may, it may change the scale, but it won't necessarily change the nature of the problem. So I think that means that there will be plenty of opportunities for Grattan and hopefully in our relationship with both our email and the Melbourne University to pursue some of those topics in the future. Um, so it really is left, it's left with me to, um, to firstly thank the State Library uh, for our continuing partnership. I'd like to think that um, in the not too distant future we'll have um, uh, these public these seminars uh, in, 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 a, in a physical forum and they can often be um, uh, a nice way to do it, but equally, I mean, these sort of um, Zoom technologies and, and platforms um, do help. Um, I'd like to thank our three presenters, um, Nicola and James and Pia Luigi for sharing us, sharing their insights. And finally, I'd thank, um, thank you who've joined this webinar today. At one point, um, there were just on 300 people um, uh, connected. Um, we've had a lot of questions. We, we tried to answer some of the ones that got, seemed to get most of the votes um, and a couple that I was particularly interested in myself. But um, uh, we might also have a look and see if we can provide some feedback on some of the ones we didn't get to. So thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Stay safe and best wishes. Thank you.